Hello, this is a supplemental podcast for the Cyber Ethics module. Um, this is looking at some of the issues we discussed in the class on net authority, um, picking up on them and going over them in a little bit more depth. Um, the names I'll mention in this podcast are all on the PowerPoint that goes with the, the net authority um, lesson. So if you're not sure about spellings, particularly for some of the more um, challenging names, then you can double check the PowerPoint and if you want to use them in essays or what have you. Anyway, um, net authority is the idea advanced by Peter Nicholson that in the past uh, there was a widespread, um, what he terms, um, deference that was shown to people in positions of social authority. Um, so he's thinking of, for example, um, deference of both children and parents to school teachers, of patients towards their GPs and their doctors, of um, society at large towards politicians, um, towards uh, people in the military, at the you know, generals, admirals, and so on, leading authority figures, um, and people towards the clergy, uh, and other not just Christian clergy, but the, the sort of uh, leadership figures of all sorts of religions, that people who wore certain, should we say, uniforms, uh, were accrued a degree of respectability and a degree of deference by other people, not only in terms of uh, being polite to them in the street and that sort of thing, but also the idea that their opinions on certain subjects carried weight. So if a, a general wrote an article in a newspaper about their thoughts on some military campaign, the fact that they were a general meant that their views on, on warfare, at least, carried weight. doesn't mean anyone would be particularly interested in their views on macrame or baking cakes, but their views on that, their, their area of expertise carried weight. Um, likewise, if a, a vicar or a priest said something connected to morality and religious teachings, that was assumed to carry authority with it rather than being challenged. Nicholson's argument is that that's largely a feature of the past that is in increasing decline. And one of the factors, indeed one of the critical factors that he considers to be responsible for that level of decline is the internet. And he's looking at that in a number of different ways. Um, one of the aspects is that um, the internet, he says, overwhelms us with information. Um, so when we're sitting here on our, our laptops and mobile phones and what have you logging online, we can access this. It's like accessing the British Library and having the, all of the books thrown at you in one go to the point where even if you are very, very bright and very well educated and so on, you're, you're still sort of overwhelmed by this tidal wave of information. And if you're significantly less bright, less well equipped to filter out and um, wade your way through floods of information, you're even more overwhelmed. And he says part of that, that the result of being overwhelmed by the flood of information is that we lose the ability to easily discriminate between good sources of information and um, less competent, not to say absolutely rubbish, sources of information so that we no longer quite know who is an authority or not. Um, one of the knock-on features he goes on to, to elaborate is this idea that um, we all have, well, I say we all, most people these days in Britain have access to the internet and know enough about how to use it. I'm not saying they're experts, but they know enough about how to use it that they could go on to Facebook, they could go on to Twitter, they could go and create their own blog, something like that. And the, so they can communicate with other people and they can share their views and opinions on, well, anything, matters of the day, matters of their own domestic life, what have you. That's adding, Nicholson is arguing, to the flood of information. So you're not just getting information from people who claim to be military experts or medical experts or religious experts or scientific experts, you're getting a flood of information from absolutely everyone on the planet, well, very nearly everyone on the planet. Everyone's got their opinion to put forth. And half the time, when we're looking at 
you know, Facebook or a blog or social media of, of one description or another, half the time we don't really know who these people are, their names. Um, if it's somebody very, very famous, you may know who they are, but the majority of the time you probably don't. And one name has about as much weight as any other name. Therefore, unless you are trained in academic research and you know how to weigh up um, competing claims of truth and insight and research and so on, then if Joe Blog says this and Mary Smith says that, if you've got no idea who Joe Bloggs or Mary Smith are in the first place, their reflective opinions carry equal weight. Now, if it turns out that they, they're, they're having a debate on um, medicine, the pros and cons of some medical technique, and Joe Bloggs drives a bus for a living, and Mary Smith it has been a, a surgeon for the last 30 odd years. If you know that, then you could well make the judgment that her opinion is more important than his opinion on matters medical. If they were discussing bus driving, it would be the other way around. But on matters medical, she is the great authority. But if you don't know who they are, then it's difficult to tell. If you are not trained to pick up on cues of language and things like that, which might help you to establish who is making a more um, reliable claim to know about a given subject. A knock-on effect of that, and this is something picked up on by various other people, and um, we'll get to some of those in a moment, is that not only do we struggle to distinguish between other people's um, competing claims to know about a given subject, but we're also moving as a result of social media and everyone having their two pennies worth to put in on every subject under the sun. We're also moving to the point where we feel that our own opinions on any subject under the sun are often as important, as weighty, as significant as the opinions of other people, even where those other people may have a great deal more experience of a particular subject than we do. Um, so you, I, I know nothing whatsoever about football and care less, but I could potentially be in the situation where there's someone who is a renowned expert on football typing away their opinions on social media and I'm typing away a disagreement and say, oh no, I think I know more about this than you do. Even though they can weigh in and say, well, actually, I've been to a million football matches, I've studied this, I've studied that, I've read the other, I've interviewed people, I've done so on and so forth to back up my claim. And my only um, validity is, is that I'm a, an internet bore who thinks they know everything about everything. If I no longer have that sense of discrimination, of the ability to weigh up um, one person's authority on a topic compared to another person's authority on a topic, then I start to lose perspective. And Nicholson is claiming that this is a sort of um, coruscating effect that, that spreads out in society. So that not only do we lose that ability when we're online, even when we're having face-to-face -face discussions and debates and, and so forth, we also start to um, blur those lines and lose those lines. Um, so examples that are sometimes given are people who go along to their GP for medical advice and under their arm they've got their home doctor book and the sheath of printouts from the internet where they have researched their medical condition presumably under the idea that they will know more about medicine than their GP does. Um, historically, that would not have happened. The GP would have been treated 60, 70 years ago as so this, this slightly godlike figure whose word was law. Nowadays, an increasingly large number of people don't wholly trust their GP and therefore want to take their own health into their own hands, even if they have no medical training whatsoever. Uh, and don't understand perhaps half the medical jargon that they're seeing in medical books and all medical websites and the rest of it. And that again is a, a sort of a knock-on effect of this. It's what's sometimes called the democratization of opinion of people who feel that they know at least as much, maybe more, than someone who does this thing, whatever it happens to be, for a living and has the training to go with it. Um, Nicholson sort of sees this as a sign of society going to hell in a handbasket. Other people are slightly less doom and gloom 
about where they feel this is going, but do agree that it can be very problematic if you're getting to the point where someone, for example, with no medical training whatsoever, self-diagnoses and then decides that they will try to access medications or treatments to self-medicate, potentially, of course, causing themselves a great deal of harm if they're misdiagnosed or, or um, the, the thing they, they believe will treat their problem, even if they have correctly diagnosed their problem, is an inappropriate treatment for their condition. So that potentially is something that could leave somebody very ill or even, let's face it, dead, um, depending on the context in which this challenging of traditional authority is taking place. Uh, another um, thinker in this area, a chap called Lee Seigel, argues that other impacts of the internet are to lead to higher levels of narcissism. You know, constantly taking selfies and putting them online. This is me, me here, me there, me everywhere, and it's all me, me, me. And there's a kind of a competitive narcissism develops. So you're on social media and you see all your friends slapping up photos of themselves on holiday and what they're having for dinner and who they're going out with that evening and all the rest of it. And therefore you feel that if you don't compete and put up at least as many photos, which are at least as glamorous as their photos, then somehow your life must be boring by comparison to their life. And so putting up other photographs is it is, is narcissistic because it's all about me, but it's not that, which is kind of um, Siegel's point that it's not a way of saying, oh, we went to the theatre last night and we saw this player, here's a photo of the actors, let's discuss it. It's not a means of leading into conversation and engagement with other people. It's just a way of kind of going me, 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 me. Um, and other people doing exactly the same. So we're all shouting across purposes to each other. We're not really engaging in conversation or debate. So that becomes unhealthy. Another interesting angle that Segel comes in on is this idea that um, along with blurring the boundaries between fantasy and reality, as with a lot of selfies, you know, somebody's having a really, really boring holiday, but they manage to get their photo at just such an angle that it looks really glamorous. And if you could actually see the, you know, the, the, the parts of the photo that they already did out, you realise it's nothing like as glamorous as it looks, and they're creating an illusion of how wonderful their life is. And is it fiction? Is it real? That all just kind of goes out the window. Not only do you get that kind of blurring, but you get what Cycle describes as commodification. The idea that life is marketable. And we think we are um, acquiring experiences. But, he argues, that you can't really buy experiences in the way we think we can, or at least in the way that large companies are using the internet to convince us we can as a basically a marketing ploy so they can make a ton of money off us. Um, so if somebody puts up a, um, not going back to the, the, the selfies bit, a photo of themselves on a, a skiing holiday in Switzerland or somewhere. What they're saying, um, Siegel argues, is their life is adventurous. This is them doing something sporty and dynamic and energetic and fantastic and adventurous. And the implication, the unspoken implication, is that if you, the viewer of these pictures, want an adventurous, exciting, dynamic, all the rest of it lifestyle, um, to, to, to have that wonderful experience, you must buy that package holiday in Switzerland. Or maybe you see another friend who tells you they're off hang gliding in Borneo or something. Um, and therefore, the experience is, is adventure and being open to, to you know, new experiences and seeing wonderful, amazing parts of the world. The commodification is the idea that you can buy this. That you just go to the right holiday package tour company and they will flog you this experience. You hand over your money, off you go, you have the experience. Then you come back and you talk about it and you convince other people to have their experience. And experience as such cannot be purchased. You can't buy love, there's an old adage for you. But there's no end of dating websites and, and dating companies who will convince you that if you sign up to their um, service, 
and you sit there scrolling through a million and one photos of all sorts of god awful ugly looking people eventually you'll come across the one true love of your life and boom you 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 click like or whatever it happens to be and you make your connection with that person so that service is offering to sell you as a commodity romance and what is romance well there's a restaurant down the road that will provide you with a, a cheesy violinist and a candlelit meal for two and you go there and you, you fork over a small fortune and you you acquire romance that said I'm, I'm well i can't be the only person who's sat in restaurants and watched two people at other tables because I'm, I'm very nosy who are sitting there with the candlelight and, and the expensive looking meal with faces on them like the back ends of buses looking bored out their box hardly saying a word to one another all evening they've got the trappings the candles the food the wine the the violinist all that guff but there's <laughs> new romance going on you can buy the trappings but you cannot actually buy experience that's kind of what Siegel's arguing um, there's another philosopher um, Slavoj Žižek which I think is how you pronounce his name I'm percent sure on that one who argues much the same thing that an awful lot of life is commodification except he goes even further than Siegel um, he says that we want to identify with certain ideologies things that either we genuinely believe in or at least you know look fashionable or something we want to to be seen to be believing in and that he argues is actually a key point of commodification it's not enough for many many not everyone clearly but for a lot of people it's not enough to be a socialist to be a feminist to be a marxist to be a whateverist you've got to be seen to be it it then becomes a performance an act what does that mean in practice well he gives the argument that you you want to um be environmentally friendly you, you, you've read a few books seen a few tv programs whatever and you've become convinced of arguments around ecology and environmentalism and preserving nature and so forth so you want to go and do things there's all sorts of things you could do you know plant trees pick up litter go and volunteer at an animal shelter something or other but for some people and Zizek argues that's actually quite a lot of people um, what they want to do is to be seen shopping in the organic aisle of the supermarket with their onions and their, their their potatoes and what have you that cost three times as much as anybody else's onions and potatoes and have the labels on them saying organic they want to be seen to have the um, Greenpeace t-shirt or the Friends of the Earth badge or whatever the trappings are and a lot of charities of course do make money from selling stuff with their labels on so that people can have the tote bag and the t-shirt and the baseball cap and all of that palaver advertising that they are supportive of a cause even if they don't do a damn thing about it in any other capacity they've got the label and that for Zizek is the point that the ideology becomes commercialized it becomes a commodity you don't really have to do anything particularly ecological or particularly feminist or particularly socialist or particularly whateverist what you can do is just buy the stuff the trappings the t-shirt the appearances that will signal to people seeing you that you are part of a movement and in a similar vein he talks about these things like um back when that when the Orlando shootings took place and that person went into a gay nightclub in Orlando and, and killed a lot of people on Facebook and social media lots of people have these rainbow filters that they put over their profiles um, likewise when the Charlie Hebdo shootings took place lots of people put up things on their Facebook saying je suis Charlie and all the rest of it as a way of of looking as if they're doing something and perhaps feeling that they are but Zizek's argument is that they're not really actually achieving anything um, except possibly in some cases to hand over money to some cause which claims to be doing something on their behalf it is possible to he's not saying you can't be an ecologist you can't be a feminist you can't be a socialist he's saying you can be all those things by doing stuff be ecological by doing ecological things 
be feminist by treating women in a respectful fashion, etc. By, by implementing action, not just by wearing the t-shirt and the hat and the trappings and putting the links on your, your social media um, profiles and all of that. For him, that is just commodification. All of these things, including the, the sort of virtual reality stuff in social media, are commodities to be purchased and displayed to give the impression that you're doing something when quite possibly you're not because you're so busy buying the stuff, putting up the links, doing all that, you're so busy doing the trappings, you're not actually doing anything meaningful, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, he does have a somewhat um, bleak view of an awful lot of things, it has to be said in many respects. He regards a lot of things like environmental disaster, um, the, the mass exploitation of women, the uh, you know, trafficking and abuse and things like that, the um, institutionalised forms of racism that create horrific problems around the world. He sees those as huge global problems to which the individual, you and I, can do virtually nothing to change. We can sign uh, prior signatures to petitions, we can click lord knows what like campaigns on social media we can bung money at charities we can write strongly worded letters to our mps we can do all of that and he argues it does not a damn bit of good his opinion is that these problems are caused by massive massive social globalized social forces that are beyond the control of individual little people like us and that the only real way of changing them is for the enormously powerful to change them, for the, the people who are at the heart of these vast social movements to bring about change. The rest of us, it's like trying to, to fell a Tyrannosaurus Rex using a pea shooter for all the difference our little efforts make. He says it makes none whatsoever. But we like to go through the motions. We want to buy our organic carrots. We want to wear the Greenpeace t-shirts. We want to, I do Twitter our support for a female Doctor Who because we feel it's making a difference, a statement, a, a way of declaring our loyalties. His opinion is that that's all just flim flam and social media feeds it. It actively encourages us to, to make token pointless gestures to keep us occupied in a sense so that we don't get disgruntled we don't get um, plunged into despair about our inability to change the things we don't like in the world. And equally, we don't get um, angry and militant and violent and try and smash the machine. We just sit there with our t-shirts, twittering away, feeling that we are doing something. When, from his point of view, it's all just a placebo. He, he hasn't actually said this, but you could make the argument that things like social media are the modern day opiates of the people. Things to keep us pacified and numbed and take the pain away rather than to actually achieve anything worthwhile and useful. Um, in a similar vein, another chap, um, Eli Pariser, talks about the tendency of social media especially to become an echo chamber. And he argues this is inbuilt in the system. An echo chamber is to be in a social situation where you're surrounded by people who think exactly the way you do on the issues that are important to you. They like the things you like, they dislike the things you like, they vote the way you vote, they have the, the general opinions that you have. So you can do that in the real world. You can sit down in the pub with a group of friends who all think exactly like you do and you'll just sit around and agree with each other. He says social media cranks that up a level because you have, uh, we've spoken in a previous lesson about this idea of um, tailored advertising, that there are algorithms that work out what kind of shopping websites you look at and then next time you're on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever, it will flash up adverts of a similar nature to things you've already bought. So it's not advertising any old stuff, it's trying to advertise things that it thinks you will like on the basis of previous web searches and all that sort of stuff which gets really confusing if you've got more than one person using a computer. Um, that becomes um, problematic in itself. But he goes on to, to make this argument that not only do computers have this inbuilt algorithm around advertising, 
They also have inbuilt algorithms that determine which political parties' adverts get flagged up, which charities' adverts get flagged up, um, all sorts of other um, flagging out. So if you've got a hundred friends on Facebook, you're not seeing the postings of a hundred people. It will flag up a select few and it flags those up on the basis that they are saying things that you agree with. And it knows what you agree with because it reads your posts and it compares it to other people and then presents you the top few. Or it looks at the kind of websites that you look at and then ties in people to that. Um, so, in effect, you, you on your hundred odd friends, you could have people who have radically different views to you, but you stop seeing those opinions because the algorithms that run the system, and this isn't someone sitting in an office somewhere at Google twiddling their moustache, uh, maliciously blocking your access. It's the very way the system itself is designed to reinforce to all of us what we want to hear. So if you're very right wing, you only hear from very right wing friends. If you're very left wing, you only hear from very left wing friends and so on. So you get the same thing again and again and again. And your ideas are reinforced, you're in an echo chamber. All you ever hear is your own voice shouting back at you. And for people like Paris, that's problematic because you never get the chance to hear anything different. How will you change and develop and evolve and consider new ideas, new thoughts, new perceptions, if you never hear them? If all you, you hear is the sound of your own voice bouncing back at you, then it's, it's stultifying, it's um, blocking off avenues of thought that you might benefit from hearing them. Even if you hear about them and then disagree with them, at least you can think, why do I disagree with them? You're not just kind of blinkered and closed off to all other points of view. So he regards that as particularly unhealthy and he sees it as something that's likely to develop and get progressively more pronounced in the years that go on as technology improves and becomes more sophisticated and different forms of social media develop that are, again, place a heavy emphasis on, on tailoring of ideas, tailoring of marketing. And it is all a kind of form of marketing, whether it's flogging you shoes or whether it's flogging you a political party to vote for. It's flogging you something. Somebody somewhere is profiting from it. And that's why they do it. So there is a sort of slightly um, sinister underlying commercial motivation to all of this. Um, going back to this issue of authority, we can ask at one level, does it matter? If I can't tell the difference between a, um, a professor of history and a street sweeper when it comes to opinions of history, does that particularly matter? To a large part, we could say no. Um, but we could think of this in a consequentialist context. If I am unable to assess value claims and truth claims about um, the best way to bake a cake, then what's the worst that can happen to me? Well, I might make a really unpleasant cake. That's about it. So the, the consequence, the knock-on cost of my inability to distinguish between an authority on cuisine and someone who's clueless isn't particularly major. But if we go back to the arguments we mentioned earlier on, on say, medical issues, if I had some severe illness, some life-threatening illness, um, and I cannot discriminate between, let's, let's say it's cancer arguments here, I can't discriminate between the opinions of an oncologist of 40 years experience and some dodgy character who thinks sticking amethyst crystals up my nostrils will realign my chakras and cure my cancer. Then the on cost, the potential consequence, is that if I take the wrong advice, I could die. Whereupon suddenly it becomes important that I learn to make these value judgments between worthwhile information and worthless information. And I'm able to distinguish between sources of people whose opinion has authority and people whose opinion really doesn't have any authority behind it at all. So it depends on the context in which this is taking place. And we could say it's therefore worthwhile people learning at a very young age 
how to assess different sources of information. What is a useful source of information? What is a dodgy source of information? If they can learn to do that in history lessons or geography lessons or something relatively innocuous, then that is a lesson that will stick with them for life. And when it comes to much more um, critical things like life-saving medical treatments, then they're already prepared and know how to make those distinctions, make those reflections. So there is a, a, an argument there for um, even on the relatively small things that aren't going to you know, cause the world to end or anything, if you can get used to doing it in one area of life, you can get used to doing it in all areas of life, including those that might make a critical difference to your survival or the survival that your loved ones, your nearest and dearest. Um, a last little bit to, to finish on. Um, there is something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. I'm chucking this in more for amusement than for anything else. But the Dunning-Kruger effect is argued to exi exist in, in the sort of everyday world, but becomes more pronounced, it's argued, in virtual reality, as an in, uh, within the realm of um, social media. The Dunning-Kruger effect is come twofold in two ways, and it's to do with cleverness. It's the argument that people who are not very bright at all often believe themselves to be much cleverer than they are. And conversely, people who are very, very bright often assume everybody else is much cleverer than they are. So you get the Stephen Fry's of this world who are super clever, who talk to everyone as if everyone else was Stephen Fry too and could understand what they're saying and how they're saying it and the kind of language they use. And it doesn't occur to them that they need to rein it in a bit um, and make themselves more intelligible if their audience isn't quite as bright as they are. But equally, you get people like yeah, the one who wants to sit purple crystals up his nose um, who overestimate their own abilities to make um, important educated decisions about things. So someone who is quite clueless, but who somehow thinks of themselves as a medical expert on matters of healing. Um, someone who read a horrible histories book once and now thinks that they are a leading world authority on the history of ancient Rome or, or whatever it might be. Um, people who, who wildly overestimate their own capacities as well as those who overestimate the capacities of the people around them. And you could say that maybe the people who design and run social media, the ones who do all the programming, are so clever they think everybody else is just as clever as they are, and the people who use it are not terribly clever, but think they are much more clever than they are. And an effect of being online, particularly in social media, is to exaggerate both sides of that, that equation, and, and both sides potentially can lead to problems in that one half fail to explain themselves in clear, plain English to the rest of the world and the other half spout all manner of potentially quite dangerous nonsense and, and get completely overinflated egos because they don't realize the limitations of their own abilities. But anyway, I'll leave you with that one. Um, and if you've got any questions on net authority, we can explore them further in class. And if you say, if you use the PowerPoints that are up on Learn and, and play this while you're looking at them, then you'll, you'll see the various people I'm talking about as you go along.